Hey guys, welcome back to the stream. We're going to be talking about the evolution of comic books, how it goes into goes from a, a printed format to where you can do anything to a restricted format where it goes to Hollywood and gets chewed out as uh, as changed from the comic books, and then getting you know characters becoming something else, and that's becoming a huge marketable commodity. But never, I found it, it never goes back on sales of the comic books. And this is what's led us to where we are now in the industry where it falls over within two weeks. And uh, because all that money that, uh, you know, everybody wrote a comic book, get into movies, realize that they don't really care about those comic books, all those guys. They only care about making money for movies and for their studios, which is quite interesting. So, um, I'm sure if you're Jared, um, the um, about two weeks ago when all this went down, comic pros were um, reaching out to the Hollywood actors and stuff. Hey, you know what, guys? All that millions you made off our product, and this is the this is like the big name, um, you know, writers and artists and stuff. For DC and uh, donating some of that to the comic stores, you know, or to us who are trying to, you know, who are being furloughed off work, who've been told to not work anymore because they can't have to pay us right now. And you, you know what the response was? Utter silence. And it's like, it's a total different industry. They don't care. And you've been trying for close to maybe 20, 30 years to get into that, uh, that group of people. You know, to market your your comic book for them, but it's a totally different industry. They don't worry about you because all you got to do is get your pen, paper, write a typewriter, and put a book out. It's like a novel, right? They don't really care about the novel until they can make money off it. And um, what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, like the uh, movie industry, you know, must be kind of pretty reeling at the moment and if you think about kind of the, the chain of all the different people involved everyone from you know the people you know that are actually you know starring in the movie or um, even if it's animation um, the fact that there's there's um, technical people um, and you know you just look at the credits on a on a film and you yeah you sort of see all the range of people involved. So the overall impact of uh, productions being uh, shut down um, uh, is, is, pretty, uh, is pretty extensive. Uh, I noticed the other day that um, uh, Netflix, for example, is, is doing really, really well at the moment, but the core problem that a lot of these services are going to be facing into is uh, a lack of new content uh, because you're going to have this sort of pretty three to four month period possibly a little bit longer where a lot of these um, productions have been shut down and remembering also that you know a lot of money is made off merchandising and you know all the ancillary things that come off the back of a of a, of a film so um, I'm not uh, certainly not justifying why um, you know the various you know production houses um, you know th them turning a, a, a blind eye possibly to the comic industry they're probably turning a blind eye and staying shuttered to pretty everyone so it's going to be really interesting to see uh, whether you know, like a lot, like lots of things that's been happening through this pandemic, I think there's going to be a lot of um, unforeseen repercussions um, as people have to see how stingy certain types of businesses and, and so forth uh, have have been through through all of this, and we may well see a a return to uh, more local production, to more yep. independent um, productions. Uh, and, uh, you know, now with the range of streaming services, um, you know, there's, there's possibly a, a really good opening there for them to be 
um, sourcing content from a whole range of different uh, mm. sources maybe, rather than their traditional sources, uh, maybe for two reasons. One, um, because uh, in order to get content back up quickly, they might need to turn to a, to a range of a range of other sources whilst the big production houses get back up to steam because they probably take a lot longer. Uh, and so your more independent productions, um, it was actually interesting, you know, some of the most interesting stuff I saw a few years ago was when there was a big Hollywood writers strike. Yeah. And, and what that was happening, a lot of the writers and a lot of the actors, um, you know, and obviously the, you know, the film crews, you know, got together and, and they started making um, their own things. So I think every time, you know, there's kind of a disruption in the market, it, it shakes things up. And so then it's kind of like, well, you know, what can we do to, um, you know, really um, w walk away from from that old paradigm and that old money source and, and find uh, new avenues now and screw them? Yeah. Um, when, that, when the writer strike happened, I was at film school. And I think it was around about maybe 2004, 2005. And um, it was interesting... You know, you're sort of uh, looking, wondering why, because they're talking about animation, they were talking about all these other facets, you know, that, that all these writers which get money for, they're saying, well, we're doing all this hard work to put out the story, but the actor who works for six months, right, and gets mil hundreds of millions of dollars for that stuff, or millions of dollars, depending on who they are, if it's a whole year, you know, years and years of work, but... And here we are, we can't make $10,000 on a project, you know, get for a, for a script. Or if we're able to, maybe we'll get a couple hundred grand, depending on what the percentages. And the other thing is, we don't get any new studios, right? We don't get any, um, a percent of earnings on the f overall marking, uh, makeup, or like profit of the movie. So, so the movie makes 100 million, we don't get a percent of that afterwards. All we get is that one, whatever percent five percent or i think it was at some point and that's it there's your check go you know and then not only that once it becomes a big franchise item you don't still get anything off that they'll get some other writer to come in and write it and somebody else will go and direct it and it'll be like sorry no we don't need you to write anymore we got your thing it happens with book mm. writers uh, i remember when we were studying this that it happens with book writers they'll say well sure we like your pandemic uh thing uh now we own all your, all your characters <laughs> you know, we all, we own we own dr jones dr jones you know indiana jones we own dr jones now so you know and uh it's very interesting that uh, like I was talking this week about uh, one of my friends from film school and he was talking about, I've come up with this idea and I said, cool, before you say anything, don't tell me anything. I don't want to know anything, you, what your idea is about. I don't want to know who the characters are. Just don't say anything. Let's talk about copyright. Because you want to know what he should do with it. And I said, the first thing we do, let's talk about copyright first. Don't send it anywhere. Send it to yourself, mail it, mail it to yourself, write down your whole story, all the bylines, all the character backgrounds, email, um, not email it. Email can work, but physical copy, hard physical copy, envelope, put it, print it out, put it in an envelope in a mail bag or uh, what well, we have, the yellow hard cardboard, uh, you know, seal things, uh, you rip open to open. Put that in a, leave that, uh, postmark that it's stamped and everything once it's come back to you put it in the cupboard safely somewhere. Now, now go and finish your story and finish all your writing about, you know, who your characters are, build around, get a lawyer, find out about contracts, learn, read yourself, and then sit down and go, so I've got this idea, and now you can start talking about it that I've got going on. And because I've been through copyright infringement on my own properties before, so I had a good idea of this, but... 10 odd years ago, but 13 years ago, uh, we had a logo stolen and it got used for a very, very prominent New Zealand product. Uh, and I learned that before I could even step, even think about saying, hey, stop, why are you using this? It was $10,000, please. I was like, hmm, you know what? I've learned my lesson going forward. 
even though it was it was out there, it was like on physical property. I had all the land. You know, I don't know if I've just come out of film school. I'm working, you know, doing, you know, working seven, uh, five days a week, shift work. I, I don't have time to do anything. I just want to work, carry on working, creating a new product. And and if somebody, and, and when I use this in the future, and if somebody comes and says, go with me, you know what? They can fight me. I'll just sit on the and carry on. They can come with all their lawyers and stuff and go, proof, proof, proof. Give me the proof. I've got proof. You guys don't. And carry on. And then and then I turn around and go, now that you've been proven wrong, money, please. You know, that was my whole thought of it. But I think this is where and you were talking about earlier about animation. Uh, one of the things that uh, WAG did, Writers uh, Association, Writers of American Guild, something like that. Uh, no, WGA, Writers Guild of America. Uh, about 10 days ago, they said to the... Um, to, the, uh, to their own writers or film writers, you know what? Go slum it with the animation people now, right? There's a chance for you to go and be an animation writer. Go quickly learn how to write that, their, their trade, which is a, another trade in itself, which is a hard work in itself. There's things you, that animations, that happens in animation that is close to uh, comic books, but is a total different thing in its own. And so they said, uh, go do that. And um, and then the animation, um, the animators union, animation union said, "What? Uh, we have a union that protects our work, and you want to get your union to tell your unionized people to come into our, take our jobs away? And this is you're right, you know. Uh, uh, and animation is a big thing now because there's so many streaming and it's so much. It's hard work." But you don't need a hundred people to do it uh, with providing the. I Hang on a second. We're going to send my helicopter okay. off. Uh, okay. Hold on. I'm just going to mute the mic there. Yeah. So the whole um, the great thing is like uh, if you haven't seen it right now, just, just stay on topic. Uh, go on. Here we go. So if you haven't seen it right now, uh, Ghost in the Shell, SAC, S-A-C, underscore 2045 is out on Netflix. It's really good. Um, and it's worth watching. Just like we saw um, of the, um, both of them, animations. I, I watch uh, more animated shows than I do live action now. It's just there's so much more adventure, so much more excitement, so much more things you can do with it that you can't do in real uh, real life, um, real live action film uh, with real actors because they'd be torn in half. <laughs> you know, even, even, even the, you know, um, some people would hurt. So, but, you know, this is where we find ourselves that uh, one, well, well, uh, one meter. Oh, yeah, so, you know, a um, couple of interesting things about what you're saying. So, so you know, one of the interesting things about this pandemic is showing that, um, you know, as far as production and content goes, uh, this stuff can be done at home. Like, I, I, I you That's know, I, a friend of mine who um, uh, is, a, is a special effects um, animator, he doesn't do it all the time now, but he, he, he's worked for, for um, some of the big Hollywood studios. He, he's worked with James Cameron on um, Avatar. And, uh, you know, uh, the last thing that he did, you know, called last year, um, he, he was doing it, um, you, know, uh, you know, in Australia. Um, mm. and he was doing it all on his own PC, and then he would upload that to the US, and then they yep. would incorporate it in. So the technology that we've got and the high-speed internet um, and, and the bandwidth that we've got, you know, allows for this stuff to be done at home. Yeah. Now, as we're saying with, um, uh, with sort of animations uh, that, you know, a lot of blockbuster films now, because they don't want to tear the actor in half, <laughs> Yeah, um, because I want to make it look as believable as possible. Mm. The amount of CGI that's being put into, um, mm. and the amount of tech into the, the visual image creation and the storytelling is getting so heavy that um, 
you know, it's 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 interesting. I think um, actors are the ones which are probably um, going to be say, facing, you know, a lot of the challenges. Yeah. Um, and as people get more used to gaming, for example, yeah. and working in, um, you know, virtual reality environments and, and the sort of characters, the imagery, uh, you know, there could be a, a, a big shift towards um, less people-based stories and it will yep. certainly let people-based complex, you know, technology and in, in intensive stories. Uh, mm. it's, that's definitely, um, you know, another one of the repercussions out of all of this is that it really does start to um, drive down the amount of human actors versus... Um, a, a, a strong increase in technology, you know, based content. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, th that's the thing, uh, like we were talking the other day about the package of, um, you don't you don't really need C Chris Hemsworth now, right? Uh, you can basically digitize his entire lives because of all the moves he's already done. We saw that with, um, oh, there was a few, wait, I think it was like early, 2000 when they started digitizing characters from old movies into ads mm, mm. and so you don't or coloring them or black and white movies and bring it on you don't really need live action live actors anymore because we're so used to seeing animated characters like hulk right i mean whoever the guy, I can't remember his name, who acts in it, or we, we can digitize him and forget him. Just come and do your voice and go away. We'll give you five, five, you know, three million for being in the movie rather than giving you the 20 million that we would do if you were acting in it. This is the, this is the you know, the, the, the slicing of the whole industry now, you know, yeah. because they've already lost something probably like about maybe $20 billion, if not more. That's like 20 movies, blockbuster movies. Um, so if they're going to look at that, I mean, if I'm a studio, I'm basically saying like, you know what? The cost of putting out a movie is around about 50 odd million. The cost of getting the actors in there is going to be at 50 odd million. You know what? How about we just give them for, give them dollars each for their voice. Let's digitize the entire thing, right? And made it for about 40, 40 million. Now we have saved close to about 55 million because that's what it's coming to. That's the same thing with, because they were on this high rise, a high ride of, I think, of um, blockbuster movies, blockbuster movies, trying to do each other with the highest grossing, highest grossing. And it's gotten to a point where it's like, well, what if it's a dud? You know, what if it's we we spend a hundred million dollars on a movie, and it's a, it's nobody wants to see it, and that's happened. Mm. You know, that's happened. The last couple of movies that came out, uh, they saw that with um, Birds of Prey, they saw that with uh, Terminator, um, Underwater, one of the most recent ones with uh, Chris Stewart, and it's going to be the same thing because. People don't like the actors, right? I, I don't. I don't mind Kirsten Dun um, Stewart. I don't th think she's, she's any, anything wrong with her. She's fine. Uh, but there's people that just won't see her movies because it doesn't matter how good the movie is. Just because she doesn't isn't able to do the the character that she's been hired to do. And it's like if you if you go to see a Keanu Reeves movie, you know it's Keanu Reeves. The only reason you get to see the movie, and you're hoping it's a good story, but you know it's Keanu Reeves. So it doesn't matter if he's in a drama, or if he's in a blockbuster, it's Keanu Reeves. Uh, you know, I think, like, let's talk about Jason Momoa. I'm looking at the post up here with Aquaman. I remember we were talking about it, why it made a big deal, uh, why it made so much money. And you said something about the fact that he took woman and he took off his top and women like to see the, you know, the bulky muscle, you know, barbarian looking dude uh, built up. So this is so men don't go to see that men go to see action and stuff and he provides the man of the action stuff. 
but then he provides the eye candy for, for the female audience. Um, who uh, might, might not even know who Aquaman is, but they like seeing Jason Momoa with topless, as much as I like seeing his tattoos, right? And he's a great character, and he's, he carries himself. The other thing was that you said he carried himself really, really well. And I think the idea of that weighs up against an egotistical actor and the nice actor. So if you've got an egotistical actor, you go, hmm, yeah, uh, you know, I don't think we want to get them working and representing our, our, um, our studio because they bank a lot of money on this. I'm not sure if you heard, but like The Flash from J JLA, like Justice League, he hurt someone recently. He actually choked this woman recently, and they basically were going to put a put it on the next one. They were going to make a Flash movie, and it's like uh, you just heard our how hurt our whole friggin' franchise. Now we're going to have to pay someone to replace you. All that merchandising of your character we had built up, and this is the thing: so the, all the design work that you know uh, he's lost his. He's going to probably lose his income for the future, the large, large chunk of it. So, um, what are your thoughts on that? You know. Well, well, before we before kind we of touch on, on that, I should have mentioned should have earlier, mentioned. of course, that one of the big risks now to the large studios, and, and these are the sorts of things we're talking about. We're talking about the range of of risks that these studios face. You know, they face uh, the constant reputational damage of, you know, the cast and the crew. Um, uh, they also face the, the, the challenge of um, how the storyline might portray certain types of uh, scenarios and issues, how they represent gender and, and race and religion. So there's a lot of complexities that these big um, studios face. And now with theatres, um, probably not really opening up across the world, uh, at least for a little while, and even then it's still to be worked out, um, yeah. how they might do it safely if, if that's the requirement. The, the other big question is, will anyone actually go? Hmm. So the... Um, the big uh, studios, um, it's going to be an interesting tussle between the streaming service providers who have got the infrastructure to get these things out to an audience and uh, a production house that's sitting on a movie uh, with no way to, 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 sh to effectively show it. Um, yeah. So a lot of these studios might actually end up being over the, um, being over the barrel um, and really beholden to the streaming services providers, you know. Um, you know, Netflix will be sitting there going, ah, right, so you want to sell us a movie, do you? Right. Oh, you, you said how yeah. much? Really? 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 Well, mm. why is that? Yes. No, I don't think we'll be doing that. What, what do you go down the road and go see Disney? Yeah. Now, this is interesting where, um, uh, you know, e either through... Um, Design or 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 just pure luck. Um, you know, notice how, how Disney's streaming service got out there. You know, you could almost say like just in time. Um, and yeah. uh, you know, that's a really great example where where a content provider has effectively decided to to go it alone. Um, no. And so. Uh, if you look at something like a Disney, you know, what, what they've done is that they're, they're kind of like creating almost almost for their version of the world. They're, they're creating a, a closed kind of system, a little bit like Apple, mm. whereas from a Disney point of view is that they've got the theme parks, they've got the merchandising, they've got the content production, and now yeah. they've got dreaming. Uh and so those types of, of business models um, are, are part of kind of this this um, con contraction and, and the kind of decentralization uh, decentralization and the dissolution of business models. So um, 
you know, there's been lots of instances in the past where some businesses have kind of like sold off all of their other bits and pieces because they go, we're just going to become a movie production house. But then, you know, they may have sold off um, the distribution part of it um, or, they've, or, you know, maybe the merchandising part is, is through another yeah. partner. So these, these business models are, I think, going to kind of change, um, change a lot. And it kind of gives gives rise to the thought then of, you know, outside of these mainstreaming um, providers, you know, um, what are the other kind of independent of alternatives? Um, and uh, how can we support them? Um, are they are they actually any better than, um, uh, you know, the major um, streaming providers? Uh, are they better than you know working with another production house? Um, you know, one of the in interesting things that you know the advent of things like Netflix. I'm just using Netflix because I think Netflix is is in effect is now the, the, the old player. Well, yeah, everybody knows it, just like everyone knows Disney yeah. or Marvel. And, and yeah. they're the old they're the old player in the in the room. Um, mm -hmm. And, and and what Netflix has managed to do is a couple of really interesting things with content. So one is, well, probably three. One is variety. There's so much variety, you know, and, and, and they're not being um, biased around uh, whether it's anime, cartoon, uh, animation, um, all different types of stories. And then within that, um, uh, they seem to have been quite prepared to go for, uh, you know, stories that can be told over many, many episodes. Um, yeah. So rather than your content having to be kind of squeezed into a, uh, you know, a, you know, ninety-minute movie, uh, you could stretch it out over 10, 10 hours. You know, and you can yeah. you can tell a proper story. You can you can take your time to tell the story. You can. You can have a scene that instead of, you know, having to um, edit it down to a to a like that. That was one of the things that I um, just found almost disturbing about the most recent Star Wars movie that came out. Mm. When was that end of last year? I think that was actually even the last it's movie. Yeah, yeah, in general, atrocious. Um, yeah, I think it was actually the last movie I I saw, and I. I found it disturbing because the the edits, the cuts on it were so quick fire. It was just yeah. by the end of it, I just felt like I was I was kind of spinning. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you look at a lot of the quality content that is coming out of um, uh, that that net that Netflix is buying, that the content yep. that they're buying is that they're they're allowing people uh, to tell good quality stories and the way that they feel the story should be told not to fit into some time envelope um I, you know with some of these series i've just been incredibly knocked knocked over by the fact that some of them you know might have anywhere up to 20 episodes yeah. you know um uh and um you know the other interesting aspect is uh that that there's no ads and yeah. When you get ads, you know that's another bummer, you know, on mm. on how you're telling that story and how your audience wants to consume your story. Yeah. Uh, and I think Netflix has done a great job in, in fact, training people to take a different approach to stories that you can pick them up and drop them, you know, wherever you are. You can watch something different if you feel like something different, and then you can go back to it and. You can easily then, um, you know, pick up the story from where you last left off, and and and, you know, you can have uninterrupted viewing without being bombarded by an ad. Now, you know, the other trick to this though is, um, you know, there is, um, uh, notwithstanding all of this, you know, th there are ads in in this content, and and really a lot of this content is advertising. It's just you know, advertising done in a much more uh, kind of subtle, subtle way. But if you if you look for it, you know, the um, Netflix content is just as littered with uh, advertising um, as your big blockbuster movie um, or your yeah. kind of mainstream it's studio production. Normally with the product placement. Yeah, that's right.
That's right. And it's, it's, uh, it's you know, before you'd, you'd know exactly if Coke was showing up on the screen because they'll drive by the Coke sign. So you knew it was, they were the sponsors. Whereas now, I mean, it's very subtle, as you said. It's um, way in the background, you know, subliminal. But the other thing is, uh, we're talking about Alex here and talking about pausing and being able to leave it and then, you know, come back and watch it without it being off air because, you know, it's live as such. But, um, I, uh, you know, what's the first episode of this? The, the, um, I think it was, what, is, what are we, Monday, Saturday night. I was surprised it was on. I'd been waiting for it. So I just turned on Netflix and, oh, my reminder came on. It's on. I was like, wait, what? It's already here? I've been waiting for it for about six months or so since they said it was coming. And so I was like, I watched the first show. I was like, yeah, excited. It's like, it moves like, it moves like a game, like a total CGI digitized uh, PlayStation Xbox game. Yet it still has the animation, uh, anime characters, line work on faces. It doesn't, uh, move away from that, so you know it's an anime, animated thing. Even though it's highly digitized as a game, uh, sort of almost a game. But the other thing is, they were talking about, and it, it was so good. I just stopped watching the. I, I, th I thought I break right because I was like, hey, I gotta handle the story. So then I went last night and watched another six episodes. I said, wait, this is a really really good story. Hold on, let me give another day, you know, wait, wait, have a break again and then come back and watch it tomorrow night, which I'll be doing today. But the thing was that it's such a, and the idea is that it takes the whole idea of um, CGI and hand-drawn animation, uh, voice acting. Oh, that's what I was trying to get to, the voice acting. So, uh, so this one, they put it out as uh, subtitles. So I'm used to subtitle movies and shows and TVs and because I watch a lot of anime. And if I have the time, I will watch the subtitles. If I'm multitasking, the dub, um, the dub English dub versions will be there. So what they had one on the top was that there was notes saying, uh, please be aware that due to the pandemic, uh, we're not able to get this in English right now due to restrictions on, um, you know, to where people are around the world and we're not able to get them in the studio to do this usually they'll be straight away in there doing an english dub so you could choose between the even i even watch it with the subtitles on while i'm listening to the english dub uh and so that you know so i can tell if they're messing around with the story because sometimes they do that and they actually quite often they do that where they try to try to um make it culturally and politically relevant to the western culture right now where they change native Japanese content that we if you're an anime watcher, you're already aware of the content anyway, and you know what their, uh, what their social, social, you know, their culture is like. And so you're very happy, good. You want to watch it because of that anyway, because you're so tired of watching Hollywood all the time, something different. And so change a lot of content. So if you have the subtitles on, you can, you can hear the, hear the English version, but you can check the words out if they're missing it, if they're trying to put in their own little political nuances. And, I've, 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 I've seen quite a few and a lot of anime fans have found that uh, they don't like it either, especially if they've been following for, you know, decades or, you know, for years. And um, which brings, um, you know, which brings, they're going to do a live action Dragon Ball Z movie. Looks like uh, Disney, we're talking about Disney. Disney has bought the, I guess they're looking to do a live action. And I don't know how that's going to work. I'm not a I'm not a Dragon Ball Z fan. I have I don't think I've ever ever seen a show, uh, an episode. But I mean that's one of the biggest out there next to Naruto and um, what was the other one? Oh, it's about the pirates. Gosh, I can't remember the name. But like they um, Netflix is doing a live action version of that TV show, ten episodes. So you know taking an anime and live actioning it. So it's. The, um, the idea is that there is so much, the thing is that there's so much opportunity and animation is on the, you know, on the forefront of it, being able to be very successful because of it. 
Yeah, and I think also uh, the quality of the stories as well. Uh, that's probably, you know, whilst I was mentioning that, you know, these streaming formats have enabled the opportunity for proper stories to be told and to be told over multiple episodes, you know, anywhere up to 20 hours for a season maybe. Yeah. And which is great. But what's really interesting is that it's not just content for content's sake that, uh, you know, unless the story is told well, unless it is a good story, um, no one's really going to hang around for the 20 hours, you know. They might yeah. hang around, you know, for the for the first episode um, to kind of get a feel for it. They might even be forgiving enough to watch a second. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, if your if your story sucks, then um, you know your twenty hours is is just you know content you know that should have pretty have just been you know flushed down the toilet. But that's not very environmentally friendly. They should have just dug a hole, uh, put the yeah. USB drive in the garden, and 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 just hope that it rusts. You know, um, well, you could just reuse a USB. Something yeah, else. Right. Well, yeah. what they could do is copy it onto the USB and then just delete it. You know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and I think this is the uh, great benefit that that comics and anime have done is that in, in a way, if you think about it, um, and this is not to, this is not about disparaging comics, comics or, or, or animation or anything. It's just the reality that, you know, their, their evolution came from from bits of paper with little boxes um, and you had to kind of look at the picture, read the text, flip the page. And in as that was really, really lo-fi technology, um, you know, obviously what kept people, you know, um, uh, interested in, in comics and the stories and the, the franchises of those stories, um, it's because they were good stories. They were good stories. And, um, you know, that's why we've, you know, obviously seen, you know, these things come into more of the mainstream, get picked up by the big studios and so forth. Uh, I think that what with, with the way that things are progressing, um, I think that more and more other good stories again are going to have an opportunity to be told and that uh you know there will be uh, uh comics and anime and so forth which uh you know perhaps yet hasn't you know had a you know a, a, a good review a good a good look uh but as the interest in in, in in quality content that can be engaging for audiences, uh, which can you know fill the fill the season, um, I think there's going to be a lot of other uh, content which is um, uh, which is going to get out there. Which which as we kind of were mentioning before, you know, you know what what are the independent streaming sorts of options, and and what are the um, you know sorts of uh, independent uh, content production units that could be developed. So if you take somewhere like New Zealand, for example, uh, you know, wouldn't it be awesome if, um, you know, at this time where potentially yep. a lot of people are going to be out of work, you know, this is, you know, potentially a really great opportunity to bring together a range of uh, the the people in the content supply chain, let's call it, um, uh, you know, every, everyone that's kind of normally involved in producing, you know, um, a piece of content from the tech people to the writers to the artists uh, to the marketing to the actual technical delivery and also other aspects of uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a certain level of expertise that's also required 
in order to kind of craft the the brand around mm -hmm. that story um, which is not necessarily just you know in the hands of you know the the writers or the original story owners and it's not necessarily about that it's you know how do these things look and feel um it's a bit like it's a bit like uh in the web world for example that they have, yep. they have people called um uh i'm pretty going to use slight the slight wrong term uh but they have uh, user design experts yeah and that's so you might have a, a technical person that can build a website you've got um you know people that are producing the content for the website but then there's the how is the person how's the public going to actually interact with the site and actually use it yeah. how are they going to be engaged beta testers yeah and so um i think that you know bringing together a whole bunch of these resources um from across the country would be would be potentially a good way to almost set up kind of like a a, a self-owned cooperative uh production house that can be yeah. a feeder for, for lots of you know various content large and small professional and amateur but by then giving it a polish um and then you know the other big thing here and and um you know we were talking before about product placement so you know obviously a lot of content's funded by either overt or subtle product placement services different references in the text, um, different yeah. images subtly. Um, you know, a lot of those uh, companies that, uh, you know, normally, you know, pour money into that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be financially constrained themselves. Yeah. Um, they're going to start to be very careful about where they're putting their money, what, what mm -hmm. content they're they're paying to, to to be in uh they may also um themselves start to really drive um the cost that they have yep. to pay uh because if you don't have um you know a film that's going to be seen by potentially hundreds of millions of people um at a theater you know that's a that's a a, a much um you know that's a significant reduction in the in the visibility that your brand or product or whatever charged us you know you may have charged us x you know to have a product placement in a, in a marvel movie and it's kind of like well you know things are a bit different now times are tight you know my grandmother's sick you know i've got the kids in the private school still you know we're just going to have to you know we're, we've got to cut our budget and um, you're just going to have to expect less. And that's going to ripple all the way through the, the content system. And that's why I think that, uh, you know, the idea of having um, a, a kind of an independent um, content production house in New Zealand um, that's kind of a feeder for, for all of these different, um, you know, people with the right skills that are required for that um, could be a, a really good way of consolidating um, the resources of the, the challenge of competing, um, but to also, um, you know, provide the uplift that's required to take content from being kind of in more the amateur realm, in the true indie realm, up to kind of the more, you know, professional, independent um, production, you know, the stuff that people will actually um not only watch on a streaming service but potentially sign up to a streaming service to watch that'd be interesting um uh, if we you know i'm sure there's somebody out there in new zealand thinking about this now sitting sitting in their home with some you know with some money in their pocket you know because there's no idea that nobody hasn't thought about it's just getting the kickstart to Put it out and i think a lot of people you know money seems to be the thing that they think but i'm always of the mind like a long time ago about 20 years odd ago when i was doing a um a documentary i had uh, several businesses involved in that like talking about content placement i had learned about that way back 20 years ago about this 
and I'd actually uh, approach Vans, the short shoe company, to uh, the skate you know the skateboard shoe company streetwear, street, to get about four pairs of their shoes in, to give in free, so we could wear it in it to advertise it because we we're doing a com uh, a a uh, skateboard uh, documentary. And then we also had Huffer provide us with clothing that we would wear for this for that. And also a local company called Etex, a young 40, 14 year old kid that had done his own thing here in his from Array, started his own little skateboard clothing company. And so we got, you know, we said, hey, look, if you can provide us some clothing to wear, we wear it, no money exchanges hand, we'll put our own stuff. I raised some funds and we did that. So I, the whole idea is that when people whenever something like that gets started unless you have someone leading it you always get somebody trying to go well you know we're going to copyright this as our idea we're going to copyright this as our idea and it gets uh stifled so quickly there was this thing um i think it was about 2018 where they were doing this whole new tvnz was putting a hundred thousand dollar uh web series thing right uh, for webisodes you could do like uh, six episodes for a hundred thousand dollars you get given and I was like that's a lot of money and I could provide you good content an hours hour, an hour's worth of content 60 minutes worth of content 12 episodes 12 five minutes ep worth of episode because I've learned how to make it work <laughs> right for less than that uh, and so but when they look at something like that when you got a government body or something like that look at that they go oh you know they don't understand and so you're gonna have like basically bend over backwards and by the end of it i was talking about uh, of um with another person yesterday off uh, about the many forms you got to fill out which stifles creativity when it comes to the arts which seriously i have like right now i could start i have so many forms to fill out tax returns uh grant requests uh funding requests I don't have the time, right? And nobody really has a time of filling out hundreds of pages of funding requests for whatever you want to do creatively. Uh, and I think most people just give up because of that, because they don't have a network. We're talking about, about network of people who can basically sign off on these things and say, hey, look, you know, question, is that, what do you think of that? Yeah, that's fine, carry on. And they just don't have the time, or they don't qualify for that. They don't understand what those words mean, those technicalities mean, uh, technical words mean, or what the legal things are, or the copyright things. And that really stifles growth. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because, and productivity and creativeness, because if you always have to be filling out forms when you should be actually creating more art and more work to sell, to produce, you know, to get it out there, you can't, it, you know, you can't be sitting there just filling out forms all day long because it takes that's you hours and hours to work through it. And I think, and and that's why I think that you know, uh, you know, one of the solutions for this is, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity to set up some genuine uh, cooperative. Uh, content production type entities where all of the people involved are all owners of the business you know they're all yep. shareholders um, that uh, depending on you know the agreement they want to make that their content um, uh, you know um, has links back to them as part of what they've contributed into the cooperative you know like we've got lots of cooperatives um, even up here in Northland, which run, you know, we've got quite a few food co-ops co and, yep. um, you know, everyone, um, you know, all the members um, need to get involved in different ways. And this is the, the and, and this is what makes, I think, now a really, really incredibly special time because, yep. you know, that paperwork, there's probably someone sitting out there who knows nothing about movies, comics, couldn't care less. But yep. they're damn excellent at um, all the paperwork, you know, yep. out of out of work 
um, tax accountants, um, mm -hmm. out of work um, uh, board members or people that, that know um, the governance of these types mm -hmm. of organisations. And we're going to have so many people in so many different industries which support the infrastructure that allows them the creative layer. But it also requires a change in our thinking whereby mm -hmm. uh, we need to start thinking about that um about how we make it um fair and equitable yeah uh, and one of the big problems about company structures um and shareholders is that um and it's really where we started this conversation which is that uh you know um, under a lot of these existing um systems the um the the, the profits go to the shareholders the profits go to the executives yeah you get movie stars earning 100 millions of dollars it's um uh, whereas a cooperative structure would allow everyone to be you know on a level playing field um and that you know the um uh the the person that that's doing the 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 boring the boring paperwork stuff you know gets paid no yeah. more than the person that is you know, writing, you know, a story that they've got full yep. freedom to write because they're making content that's, you know, that demands it. Uh, and um, I was actually on a, um, a an interesting call uh, last week um, which I was talking about, you know, in the US, for example, there are literally thousands of these uh, worker-owned organizations and yep. they were talking about how we're probably going to see a lot more of them pop up now because yep. as businesses go bust there's this opportunity for the workers to actually come together and say w we will either buy out that business um mm. they're hoping that they might be able to be um, you know, this would be a potentially a great way for government subsidies to be directed, right? Yeah. So instead of giving us a wage subsidy, say what we will do is that we, we will put money towards your new cooperative business that you're setting up right. to help you get that established, to give it funding um, so that you can actually then get underway. And then instead of potentially um, 100, 200, 500 different you know, people that are part of that content production, instead of, you know, them all, you know, being on the dole or having to work multiple part-time jobs on a minimum wage, that they actually get part of a business that they can actually yes. be invested in for its success. And I think the other thing is, like, I mean, like we, we um, just, you know, last week or this weekend with Disney paying out 1.7, 1.5, 1.7 1 .7 billion dollars in dividends to its higher ups and to its shareholders while laying off 100,000 plus workers. So on the one hand, they, they, uh, they're gifting themselves with all the money which could go towards paying, you know, helping uh, keep these uh, workers fed and their families fed. And this is, I mean, this is this is the way those those you know companies work. I mean, as someone who's actually sits on a you know as part of a shareholder kind of comp a, comp a company uh, with Plunge, I'm always mindful of how much hours I put in. I put in hundreds of hours a week, you know, compared to what somebody else would put in. So if I'm, you know, and I'm like, well, I'm not worried about my take home pay and for um, for until we get this up and running, but I still have to note down how much work we're doing because at the end of the day, someone's going to go, well, how much did you put in? You know, and if we... Oh, and that's not to say that, um, you know, it's not to say that uh, you couldn't have your own um, personal little business. It might be yeah. you and a couple of other people. You can still yeah. plug that, you, you know, your own existing business. You could mm -hmm. then still plug that into a cooperative right organization you know and so it's a cooperative that perhaps is is um you know an assemblance of lots of little small little businesses um individuals um you know kind of more direct employees but the concept being that um it you know whether you're an individual or a company you are all equal owners yeah um, of, of that 
of that business. Um, and, you know, there's some really great stories out there emerging now of, um, you know, worker, you know, contributor, creative run, uh, run businesses. Uh, but, you know, the, the time in the past hasn't really been ripe for this to happen. You always need some disruption in the system. Yeah. Uh, and this is this kind of almost perfect storm whereby you've got a whole bunch of creative people out of work. You've got a whole bunch of administrative people out of work, a whole bunch of marketing people, a whole bunch of tech yeah. people. Uh, and, and um, you know, there's really this opportunity for, for all of those kind of disparate groups to kind of come you know, come together and say, hey, why don't we, you know. Um, and also, um, you know, what's to say that, you know, there couldn't, that there might not be some interest shown by some of these big streaming services as well, is, is yeah. saying, look, you know, we, we're, we're looking at, at setting up a, you know, a, a content, uh, a content factory you know, um, as an umbrella for a whole bunch of amazing creative people across the country. Um, you know, if we can produce quality content, you know, would you be interested in it? You know, um, yeah. and um, and and start the start the discussions. You know, check what they're interested in. Um, uh, but you know, some of these things, unfortunately, they they're just really not going to be successful if you know um a thousand different creative individuals are all kind of like knocking on netflix door and going yeah. like you know yeah. um you'd kind of need a sponsor you know and and um you know new, new zealand is kind of lucky because it's got some big names up there who hmm. um you know there are people that you know obviously have got connections and you know, it's not that you want any. You know, it's not, for example, you you want Peter Jackson to be part of the 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 thing or whatever. It's just, yeah. hey, Peter, you know, do you know someone at Netflix that we can talk to, right? And, That's right. And, and you know, we're doing Netflix a favor instead of you know a thousand creative content producers from across New Zealand exactly. wanting to get on Netflix. We're actually willing to come together, work together, and then you know negotiate and work with you you know, one-to-one, -one because um, otherwise it's just not going to happen, right? They, they can't yeah. be talking to, to a thousand people. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like how many times you have to pitch to somebody before you, you know, you get your pitch through. And if you have someone who's already done the, you know, has already done it, knows someone who, who actually gets them through the door, I think that's a good idea as well. I think you're right there. Um, having someone there, because it takes away the fear of, approaching on your own self yeah, and of right. course the, and and that's the other thing when when it comes to pitching to companies anyway they don't want you unsolicited pitching to them and um because they want you to make sure that they 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 are protected first and foremost from you lit for your you know you're um, suing them for some sort of breach of con um, content uh and that's why i talk about the whole copyright making sure you know what you're talking you know your copyrighted yeah, yeah. material and trademarked it or such but they also, you know, you don't want to have to be up there going, um, and this, uh, uh, I forgot to bring that. Um, or they could have just someone who's going, okay, so, um, yeah, remember, okay, so this guy's here, got this sorted, yeah, we're looking at this much money and this, 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 this. Let me know when you're ready and we'll come and see you. Yeah. And then they'll, and they'll come. There's, come a, couple, the middle there's a couple of other favorable things in the current climate. One is, Whilst you're having those negotiations, right? Mm. Everybody's out of work anyway. Everyone's yeah. out of work, right? And 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 yeah. and um, so they're in the they're they're potentially in the shit anyway, right? Yeah. Um, but at least you know maybe they've got access to to at least some sort of government government mm. assistance in the meantime. That hopefully that whilst they're um, getting that government assistance or doing whatever work they can. That then you know this creative powerhouse can then actually be put together because see normally the problem when you start a business right is that you're in this catch twenty two you you can't you can't run the business unless you've got money and you yep. can't pay people but of course you can't actually make any money unless you've got people doing stuff so we've got right. this kind of opportunity whereby a lot of the creative people the content uh, makers are out of work anyway or mm. got li very little work. Um, or even if they are working, a lot of people make stuff on the side, you know, in their own time anyway. 
Um, yeah. The other, so so we've got kind of like almost like this paid creative workforce that's kind of sitting there. Um, so that's great, right? So it means that whilst yeah. you're doing your negotiations, you've got your creative workforce, which can actually already be be doing stuff, you know, in the background. Yeah. The second other thing is that I bet anything that the people with the industry know how the people that know who to talk to, the people that are great negotiators, yeah. I, I absolutely guarantee that some of those people are, are today sitting there out of a job themselves, right? right? And they're looking for something to do. And whilst, you know, they're on the dole themselves, you know, they might have been, been some big hot shot for one of the TV organisations yeah. or, you know, or maybe they were maybe they were working, you know, because don't forget that there's, a, there's an immense amount of professional talent that came back to New Zealand as a result yeah. of pandemic, right? From yeah. Hollywood, from Europe, London, New York, there's lots of people that have come back that have got this type of professional expertise. They're sitting yeah. there with nothing to do as well. So, you know, this is where, you know, this is a really incredibly, incredibly unique opportunity, um, you know, for these types of organisations um, to come together. Uh, we've got the disruption. Uh, we've and, and, and now New Zealand is in this even more unique position itself, which is that uh, the way that uh, the pandemic has been handled is leading to a fact that we might end up with, and it's not just about the easing of restrictions, it's not just about going from level four, to level three to level two to, you know, back to kind of freedom. Um, it's that the... The, the safety of people it, working in New Zealand is, is going to get to a very high level quite quickly, which will yep. allow for both, um, you know, particularly in-person content, you know, production, um, you know, to be done here. Uh, whereas, you know, we might find in places like the US, uh, and don't forget that, you know, a lot of... Um, uh, international production houses do often do filming in what, what you would call like yep. lower cost locations, right? Yep. Well, some of those lower cost locations are, are, are going to be so potentially dangerous to go to on a whole range of different reasons. Yeah. That um, uh, and and even pr doing production in in the US is is probably yep. going to you know, like it's going to be quite challenging for them to do production, or if they do production, they're they're running a very high risk of of you know all of a sudden the whole crew, the whole set, um, getting um, uh, you know being infected with COVID nineteen. So uh, you know, you, you New Zealand is shaping up to find itself in a in a really really unique position um, very quickly. One thing I was thinking, like you mentioned about, like you know, having people come back who are very high tier, uh, experience, and especially in the IT and uh, and the movie industry and content provision, we're going to get for a while because of the pandemic. We're going to get to keep them here hmm. because they're going to be going well. Do I want to risk going back to the UK, to Europe, to uh, you know, to India, to China, to Asia, to America to work, or should I take a lower pay cut? You know, let, you know, get a discounted wage and be safe. And mm. that's what it comes down to: is do I, do I, you know? And this is the thing I uh, discussed with somebody yesterday about the fact that we're in a good place right now to say. That project I was trying to get started, um, you were you were saying how much was the quote? Um, can we negotiate now? Because obviously you need our money, and uh, we need to, you know, get a, you know, save some money ourselves. So can we negotiate? And this is the same thing that's going to happen with the pay packet at the end of all these very highly qualified entertainment industry people. Uh, you know, in all facets of entertainment. And especially, the yeah. and especially where I think that, you know, a lot of, 
creative people across New Zealand and even potentially, you know, people that have, you know, uh, been very, very well paid in their professional capacity. I think, you know, this pandemic has caused um, a lot of people to rethink their priorities yes. and to really value uh, human connection and better outcomes for people. Um, and the reality with a lot of the mainstream content, you know, production is that there's a lot of people taking a, a, a big fat cut of cash along the way, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, that's where I, additionally I think New Zealand has got this uh, potential for an amazing competitive advantage of, of, of a lot of people able to come together creative who are not greedy, yeah. um, just want to get, you know, reasonable income for 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 their work, uh, and and that could actually mean that New Zealand, um, you know, a, 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 a production, you know, powerhouse that's run as a cooperative, mm. um, could could provide a really interesting competitive challenge as far as the cost of content production because there's not all these greedy people yeah. along the way um, wanting to take a big cut, and so the 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 cost um uh to a streaming service um landed ready for them to to consume um could be done significantly less i was just thinking one of the creatives um who started from independent like i mean there's so many big um kiwi guys who've made it out there but one of the most recent ones that i've actually you know watched uh guns akimbo have you seen that yet no, no. So no, Guns Akimbo okay. is written by uh, a Kiwi uh, horror writer. Uh, let me just bring this up. Guns Akimbo. Actually, just whilst uh, you're uh, mentioning that, um, just in case people are interested, I've noticed that um, someone brought to my attention that there's a bunch of Peter Jackson movies now that, are, that are now available on YouTube for free. A lot of his early stuff. Yeah, he's put up wow. for free. Those are great dependent amazing yeah. movies we, i but, mean i watched them before i went to film school but we also studied them at film school yeah, to see yeah, yeah. the difference between lord of the rings and what it you know over the years it come to yeah. you know from meet the feebles yes you could yes, never that, make yeah, meet the yeah, feebles yeah. this horrible culture we you know um social culture we live in you could <laughs> never make that yeah and that's so up there now to watch, watch on youtube yeah but but the meet the feebles is amazing uh, New Zealand humor, taking the Muppets, or adult, or um, maturizing it, and then just you know, uh, just the whole, the Hollywood of that and that as well, the undertones of social commentary that comes with that. So Guns of Kimbo, uh, a um, Jason Lee Lee Howard uh, started up with. Working on a um, a show, his recent show, Guns of Kimbo, stars uh, Samara Weaving, the Aussie um, actress, Reese Darby, and also Daniel Radcliffe from Harry Potter himself. Um, um, and it's a really hardcore, very indie looking movie. You know, it's not flashy, but it's full of full of um, you know so much amazing things so he comes from a background of visual effects uh having worked in wolverine worked on avengers and um he was also on the pork pie movie as a compositor uh gods of egypt the hobbit um uh, man of uh man of steel but the last um his own that he worked on that got him there was deathgasm Death Guest mm. is a um, is a very interesting uh, heavy metal type movie about um, supernatural elements, horror, and it's very very Kiwi. And it's just you know, and he you know that shot him to fame. It was just like a very low budget movie, uh, but it cost something about oh where are we here? They bring the budget up. Will they bring the budget up? No, they won't give us a budget. But it was a very low budget 
uh, he made was it uh, Shane who was who was supposed to join us today? Hopefully, he'll be tomorrow, the sometime this week. He loves horror movies. He just he loves the whole low um, um, independent horror movies, and he's really into that. And he um, and he knows a lot more about that than I do. And he said that the low um, that like you know low budget independent horror movies kiwi horror movie does really well and that um that new zealand understand that um, the production house in new zealand understands that and they're able to really really market it around the world really well because there is a huge underground you know uh fandom real loyal fandom for horror i mean i grew up as a teenager watching more a lot of horror i i don't watch horror that much now because i'm on you know I'm just not my thing right now as we go through, you know, different facets of, you know, you go from fantasy to horror and whatever. And like right now it's animation. So he started out by doing Deathgasm and, you know, having decided to work on all those movies, saved up his money, I guess, and then decided we're going to make this movie. And, and as an independent creator, puts this out, gets picked up by Hollywood, gets to put more money, more money behind it because they see the quality of his work. And I think, you know, um, I'm sure he's probably wanted to come home, you know, and he wants to say, hey, look, I've, I've, I've made it up there, but now, hey, why can't we do a bit more, you know, put a bit more people out? And I think that is something that other countries don't have, I think, in a sense, that, uh, that, that idea of number eight wire, but also lifting up others around you, I think. Mm. Mm. I think there's a very unique kiwiness to us that we have as a culture where we're so whānau, whānau orientated that we want to raise others up along with us because we realize that it's lonely at the top, you know, because unless you're surrounded by your friends at the top, and this is what happens with a lot of creatives, they go off the deep end because they are, you know, they've left all their all their friends behind who, who, you know, so they've only got people who say yes, 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 but they don't have people that say, hey, mate, <laughs> that, you need to sort that out because those guys want their checks paid. They're not going to tell you the truth about yourself. And I think a lot of people are going to, you know, Kiwis having us to say, well, you know, yeah, just, just, you know, just chill, settle down a bit. Go, now go and sort that out. And I think this is what's going to happen with all the all our crabs coming back. I think is they're going to actually start going, well, it was fun at the top while it lasted because look at us. We're back home and we left all our mates behind. We could have helped them. And now we're back at the mates are going, oh, so you've come back now, eh? <laughs> because we have that. We have that in our culture as well. That a whole tall poppy syndrome we have, um, you know. Uh, we'll, you know, you guys have the larrikin thing, you know. Uh, we have the top hoppy thing where we, you know, we, we. If you're not helping people get up the top with you, and you're just, you know, you're gonna get knocked down. But there is opportunity to help others along with you, and I think if you have that cooperative, as you mentioned, that they'll, you are actually gonna end up with the next generation, and the next generation, and if. And if you want a productive, um, long-lasting artist, artistic entertainment industry in New Zealand, I think you're right. That's the way to go. Is to actually provide a um, a house where you can basically just fill out forms. <laughs> you know, just fill out form. Someone over there deals with your old budgeting. That one does there that. And it's not the dauntingness of creative New Zealand. And I've, I've and talking about creative New Zealand, I've actually had artists who've been working for 20 years who just go, I can't believe they need me to fill out so many forms, even though I've they already I've given them everything I've got. They already can see, just go on my Facebook and see all my history. But they don't want it. They don't have the time. You know, they don't, or they can't take 10 seconds out of the day to go, oh, that's who that is. Be you know, it's like, it's like being in the doll repeating over every time you get a new case manager, you know, 
and um, these 30,000 new unemployed are going to find that. But I think having that house is, would be very good. I mean, I, I, somebody should do it, you know. If, um, and, and, this is, and this is always the um, the challenge, isn't it, is that it's, um, you know, you, you're right. We, we need someone to do it. Uh, and, you know, that is definitely uh, a challenge. And, of course, you know, often the rhetorical question is, you know, well, uh, we always say, you know, somebody else, should, you know, somebody out there should make this happen, you know. Well, right. you know, it, it could be us, you know. Yep. But in saying, in saying that, in saying that, uh, you know, you don't always have to jump from saying, hey, here's an idea, um, wouldn't it be great if that would happen? You don't have to jump from that and then go, you know, you're, you're sitting on the board of directors now and, and, and you're the one, you know, yeah. kind of running your life away because, you know, you were the yeah. one. You, uh, so so yeah. the, 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 the starting the idea doesn't have to mean, and in fact, in a way, this is kind of, I suppose, the spirit of this kind of co cooperative type approach um, mm -hmm. is that, and and look, I've I've known people um, who uh, I, I know quite a few people who have started um, uh, arts-based cooperatives, mm. uh, particularly in Australia, and uh, it it usually requires that you need to get a group, a good kind of core group of people, and then you need quite a few um, uh, kind of different supporters. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, the step of filling all the paperwork to set up one of these type structures, um, uh, you just need to find, you know, those people, you know. Right. And, and this is where, uh, you know, rather than necessarily leaping to, and, and actually here, here's the other great aspect of this, about this, right, is that, you know how you were talking before about copyright and about kind of like having to, secure your idea and, and mm. kind of like make sure that no one takes it off you. You know, uh, the, this kind of concept of saying, you know, let's create a, a, a cooperative, um, cr you know, um, uh, worker-owned um, content powerhouse mm. you know, for international, you know, um, uh, uh, distribution. Um, I don't care if someone steals that idea. I, yeah. I, I hope that they might. You know, kind of like say, "Hey, you know, we, yeah. we, we join us." Not too sure yeah. what you can do, but you, you know, we're, you're welcome to join us, right? This, yeah. this is the great idea about ideas that you actually want to be stopped. I want someone to take this idea and to steal it and to go, "Yeah, that's yeah. a really good idea." Let's get a group of people. And so, you know, one of the ways that we should be approaching these things is is not going like, "Oh God, like I've got to start a business." It's like, no. All you have to do is to spread the idea and right. say, who would like to join us and help us build a um, cooperative content production powerhouse? Who's interested? Here's the range of people we're looking for. We're looking for the person that can negotiate with Netflix. And actually, wouldn't that be a hilarious, like, you know, if, 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 if we actually make this happen, right, you know, and we do yep. a, a Facebook post, it would be hilarious, get, you know, that it gets picked up by the New Zealand here and they go, and, and, and here they've explicitly said they are looking for a high-profile uh, experienced Netflix negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are looking for someone to yep. do all the boring paperwork that we yep. can't do. Uh, we are looking for people um, that are bored shitless but that are amazingly creative. Like just even making yeah. the ad for it would be hilarious, you know. Well, I um, mean, here's, here's Ed. Here's Ed. If you're watching and if you have any sort of ideas on how to... Um, how to make the ad. How to make the ad how to even. Make the ad. Yeah, how to make the ad. You're welcome to do that. But here's what we want. We want someone who's got a, a way in to Netflix. We want someone who knows how to for, sign forms out that we don't want to sign. Someone who knows how to do the whole copyright. And someone who knows to do accounts. And uh, someone who basically 
doesn't say that idea won't work. But someone who says, let's see how we can make it work, because that will bring other people who actually can help make that idea work or change it on a bit. And this is the other thing. Don't be afraid to make money. Yeah. The thing about artists, the artists, the, the why projects don't get started is artists think they're social people until they run out of money. Yeah. That's what it comes yeah. down to. They, they think about, somebody else should uh, pay for it. Yeah. They expect somebody else to pay for it yeah. and they'll, they'll, they'll make it. And I've run into that so many times. If you yeah. don't want to. Soul, you know? yeah. and, and this yeah. is an opportunity for, if you have a legal structure whereby, mm -hmm. you know, they're part of the business, you know, yeah. make as much or as little money as you like, you know, but you get to own your content, you know, or yeah, if you want to give your money away, that's fine. But yeah, don't make but, somebody else, don't make somebody else give theirs away on your behalf. Yeah. Just give away yeah. your part. And I think yeah. the, the weird thing is that sometimes artists get hung up about like, you know, uh, I want to start a project. I have no money. Then they realize that, actually needs money to start a project yeah. and then they go where do i yeah. go to get it because well why don't you just keep working part-time while you yeah. make your product and because what it'll do is people will see your product and see you how hard working you are and get involved because they say well, they don't yeah. nobody wants to help someone who's who isn't going to do half the work yeah you know? um it's um it kind of reminds me of uh, a band uh i i would hope that a lot of people know this band because um, along with a lot of other people, um, they were responsible for opening up this type of music. And I'm talking about um, UB40. Yeah. Uh, UB40, the, the uh, UK reggae band. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, kind of like music buffs would definitely. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we in New Zealand, uh, we grew up with it, you know. Like, the, if you have the 90s, interesting thing is that um, not, not a lot of people kind of know, like, why were they called UB40? Mm. And and the reason why they, were co they called themselves UB40 is because they all met when they were in the dole office. Yeah. And the unemployment form they had to fill out was called Form UB40. And right. so... You know, that's how they adopted that kind of as their band name. But what was interesting about this was that they they, they met because they were all in the, the same circumstances together. They were all out of yep. work, all having to, you know, face through dealing with the system. You know, these were, you know, like no one can say that these were not, you know, really great creative people. They just found themselves in, a, in circumstances whereby their passion their skills yes. um, and and perhaps actually also their ineptness, right? Um, yeah. or, you know, it, it was kind of like, you know, the fact that they came to, together and, uh, you know, like I, without going into kind of the, the whole background story, but, yeah. but clearly them coming together and forming a band meant that they were much stronger um, and much more successful than what they were all individually. Yeah. Um, but, you know that they found themselves in, in a system um you know at a time in england when england was going through significant financial um, mm -hmm. problems and social upheaval and I, I think we're in this time now you know so we yeah. need to kind of have our ub40 moments where where all of all of us creative people who are out of work or underemployed i think i think the biggest problem across the arts community is not so much necessarily uh, the absolutely starving artist, but we definitely have those. Yes. Um, not that there isn't, you know, a good level of um, government assistance, but the problem is, is that you know most people can't. It's just not possible to live on that, particularly if you live in a in a, in a major city or even a place like Northland. Rents yeah. are not that different from Auckland, as we were talking about yesterday. Yeah. Um, but most people are un underemployed. You know, they could be doing more paid employment. But, you know, when you're an artist and when you've got passion and when you've got skills, um, this is where, you know, obviously when they when UB40 came together as a band, you know, eventually they had people around them that actually helped them go from being 
um, a bunch of guys that met um, at the Dole office uh, to being, you know, the, the you know, historically si significant band that they eventually became. And this is, yeah. you know, when we're talking about these types of cooperatives, you know, we always need to extend our thinking to the other skill sets and professions um, that are sitting out there, bring them in because, you know, a lot of creatives are really shit at, um, you know, mm anything else other than the creative thing that they're really good at. And this is an incredible opportunity to bring together all of those skills. So so let's start, start writing some job descriptions. Yeah, I think we all, I mean, we've been sitting around for about four weeks. Um, we're still probably gonna be sitting around for another three weeks, even though we're supposed to come out of level three. Now it's probably a good, a good time to say, well, who do we reach out to? I mean, we've yeah, been discussing quite a, a lot here on, on on the various people I've interviewed and stuff. I mean, Hindu, uh, Julia, yourself, um, you know, especially locally, and discussing this, you know, about the um, funding, arts, people to work with. And I think we, we, we've been sitting down for four weeks doing a lot of work or not doing much, but now we can actually start reaching out with ideas yeah. saying, hey, now we can connect. Now we understand how the digital media works, how uh, how um, social media works, how the app, um, apps we've been using, how Zoom works, you know, on all the stream yards and all these different pressures. Um, but also how do we can also connect with other people? I mean, I've got a couple more interviews coming up this week with people that I haven't seen for a while and saying, hey, you know, um, across New Zealand. And, because they're they're in the same boat as well. Like, mm. how do we, how do we, you know, some of them are doing really well because they've utilized their online websites. Uh, some of them have um, been able to um, previously build up a good, uh, good following, but there are others who haven't. And so, by doing this, we we've, we've been discussing this quite openly, quite well. I think about giving people some ideas on how to actually go forward in the next six months after this and i think yeah. um thank you i know uh, we took about half an hour more time of yours than we no, did that's fine. thank uh, you been, um you know hey who, who knows this might go down in history as um you know the random conversation like pretty many random conversations happening during this lockdown exactly. time uh that yeah. lead to and, and feed into you know better outcomes for all of us um, compared to where we were. So thank you so much for your time. It's been awesome to, to be you. online. All right, guys, thank you for joining us. Uh, myself and Jared, uh, Malfunction. Um, hey, uh, we'll probably do another round of this because I think um, there's more to talk about on this um, platform, on these um, these ideas and uh, especially on content providing, especially at this time because there's so much more going on than and more thinking going on than it was before so thank you jared and thank you guys for watching so uh join us during the week we've got a few more coming up Kaki.